Josh, thanks very much, Ed, Suresh, David, Shashank, thank you very much. And as a, a guy who lives in Washington, D.C., but is from middle Georgia, I'm all for the rural renaissance. Um, we have one last exciting panel before we transition to our working group sessions this afternoon and our evening panel. So as Josh just foreshadowed, this panel is going to be addressing how do we expand participation in our innovation ecosystem and really bring in the missing millions. I'm going to call onto the stage our moderator, the CEO of Futura Health, a member of the Council on Competitiveness, Von Tonquin Lavin, and she will introduce her fellow panelists. So this uh, 240 panel examines the missing millions and expanding the participation in the innovation ecosystem. Maybe we can flip the next slide. Um, good afternoon, my name is Vantone Quinlevin. I formerly served as executive vice chancellor of the largest system of higher education in the country, which was the California Community Colleges. Uh, now I'm CEO of Futuro Health. And you know, Ed Seidel ended with the um, call to action around partnership and collaboration. Um, and Futuro Health is an exam exemplar of how employers who normally compete with each other uh, and higher education who normally compete uh, or may not work with each other actually are all coming together in order to solve the healthcare workforce crisis. Um, and so it's not just innovation that needs partnership and collaboration, but also workforce development is a team sport and not an individual sport. So with me today is a panel of experts who live and breathe the spirit of inclusiveness from their current but also their many prior roles. Uh, we have uh, Major General Ed Bolton, Senior Advisor of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and former, formerly SVP of Defense Systems Group of the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, we also have Dr. Robert Johnson, President of the Western New England University. And then we have Dr. Elizabeth Leboa, Provost of Southern Medical Methodist University. So um, because we are the 240 panel, I asked Chad if I could do an interactive exercise just to put uh, some people on the spot. So I know that's already getting your adrenaline going. So this row right here, the, the farthest row, one, two, three, four, I'd like all of you to stand up. Come on, you can do it. Just, all right, ready? All right, so. First, uh, and the rest of you, you, I'd like you to follow my directions here. And your job is to clap loudly after I make these announcements. Okay, those of you standing up, you have just won, your consortia has just won a $100 million innovation grant. All right, clap. <laughs> very, very good. Next. This consortia now has created education paths into all those good jobs that are going to come about from those innovation grants. The rest of us will clap. Okay, now you're going to generate 50,000 new good jobs in your backyard. And the only people who are qualified are those who are your family, friends, and community. Okay, how about all of us clap? Yes, all right, go ahead and sit down. All right, I just wanted you to get a little bit of a visceral feel, right? The innovation economy is fantastic if you see yourself in it, or you see that your friends, family, loved ones can participate or have access to it. Um, and that's the work that we have to do. So I'd love for our panelists to introduce themselves and provide an example of how their organizations are connecting communities to the economic and entrepreneurship opportunities created by those innovations. Let's start with you, Ed. Good afternoon, how are you doing? <clears throat> uh, uh, we didn't know she was gonna do that either. <laughs> uh, so you already know I'm Ed Bolton, uh, retired uh, military, retired uh, uh, aerospace executive, former uh, SES, and I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you all for this great work. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Aerospace Corporation's journey uh, in this. Uh, we're a federally funded research and development corporation. Uh, we focus on providing space expertise uh, to the federal government and others. Um, <clears throat> in a watershed moment in, in our history, in our view, 
uh, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, many of our employees were very personally, very viscerally impacted. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking and listening to folks. And as a leadership team, uh, Steve, the CEO, decided that we will double down because we believe if you say that uh, bringing in the missing millions, and if you look to about 20, 2045, this will be a majority minority country, right? And so the missing millions are already here. Uh, we believe leaders, the number one thing they do is provide an environment where people can do their best work, and we think diversity, equity, and inclusion is a mechanism to do that. And so we put programs in place. Uh, we uh, collected survey instruments. Uh, we did benchmarking with our fellow FFRDCs and um, evaluated how we were doing and rinse and repeat. Uh, we went through that cycle multiple times. Uh, we're proud of our work, but this is a marathon, uh, not a sprint, and happy to take questions on any of what we're, of what we're doing. Uh, the key is that recruiting representation and retention are the are three focus areas. Um, we think that also a key to expanding is scalability. And so our CEO and 30 other CEOs decided that they would focus and take a pledge uh, to reach up to 5 million students in the STEM area uh, and uh, put together about 3,000 interns, diverse interns, and then to also work harder in recruiting and then to start to work to have a leadership team uh, that looks like America. Because we think that's, that's the way to go. And so that's called Space Workforce 2030, uh, the internship a part of it was announced by Vice President Harris in, in uh, August. Uh, and we uh, have got this team to commit. We're benchmarking the data. We'll announce this at the Space Symposium. And each year, we'll come back and reflect and provide lessons learned and try to expand the work that we're doing. Back to you. Um, thank you. Can I get that grant? <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Robert Johnson, president at Western New England University. We are in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, when I think about connecting to uh, the local community and, and, the, and the university's work, it is really centered around the whole idea of learning agility. Actually, this fall, we will be launching an institute on uh, personalization and the future of work, which will literally give um, young people and the broader community, the ability to learn, unlearn as a steady state. Understanding that my son and daughter, who are now 27 and 29, will have upwards of 17 jobs in five different industries. Three of those industries don't even exist. We're educating young people for, 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 for jobs. Um, we can't just give them the, the, the skill set. Everyone's focused on the skills, which I think is really important. But what we're, what we're doing at Western New England is focus, focusing on the skill set and the mindset because our job is to help the students get that first job. And then they have to create every job thereafter, even if they work for your company or for your organization for the next 20 years. Even if you're providing them with stackable credentials where they're getting a certificate, if you will, in cybersecurity, well, guess what? Whatever they learn today when they graduate with that certificate, Three to five years from now is obsolete. So they have to have the mindset to learn, unlearn, and relearn as a steady state. So we're working with the community as part of a public-private partnership with federal, state, and local funding, as well as the university's funding, to create this, this opportunity for the community to come together and talk about the skill set and the mindset. So for example, we had a robotics institute on campus uh, two or three weeks ago. A uh, couple of thousand people uh, on campus, young people, hands-on experiential. For our business students, they must have 100 hours working within their specific discipline of hands-on volunteer experience in that type of business. So if they are an accountant, they have to go work with someone who's in accounting. If they are uh, in, in, in finance, finance. Uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, so forth and so on. Our law school, over 21,000 hours of every 100% of our law school graduates going out into community, bringing the community to us, having experiential opportunities, understanding that we are only as, as good as, 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 as the um, uh, external community. If we have a strong external community, we have a strong university. If we have a strong university, we have a strong external community. 
Thank you. Before I uh, answer, I had to uh, share, Robert got me down this spiral thinking about the workforce since my husband and I have five kids, four still in college and one in high school. I realized, gosh, we're never going to stop working ourselves. And yes, now I've got to think about them having 17 different jobs. How's this all going to work out? And when they uh, graduate, they come back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm Elizabeth LeBeau. I'm provost at SMU. And I just wanted to thank you, uh, the organizers, for having me. This is my first council on competitiveness. I've really learned so much. And it's, it's truly an honor to be here. Uh, it was actually very difficult for me to narrow this down to just one thing. At, at SMU, we're, we take a um, uh, strong focus. We have a motto, world changer shaped here. We instill in our students and talk with our faculty, staff, and students about ethical leadership. So a lot of what we um, think about when we're doing curriculum is not just the most innovative curriculum, but how do you then go out and, frankly, make the world a better place. Um, we're very dedicated to our community, and we have a, a very close connection to Dallas. The mayor uh, actually tweets about us and shares highlights about um, SMU because we work so hard to try and make our community a better place. So the one example I will give that um, is a fairly recent one that I'm, I'm very proud of is, is the West Dallas STEM School. So um, Dallas is, is a... Is a, DFW is a, is a huge metroplex, and the socioeconomic range is immense. Um, uh, so we have some of, of some of the greatest wealth, and then you have areas that it is uh, we have very underserved populations. So what our School of Education and Human Development did was go into a collaboration with Toyota USA. Uh, Toyota USA realized that for the workforce they need and the tech workplace they need, uh, to Ed's point, we're not we are not going to produce enough of the technical workforce. Our 2019 census is we were 40% people of color. In 2021, high school graduates were 48.6, I think, people of color. And yet, the college graduates were in the 30 percentile, 32, 30 percentile people of color. This is not good. So what we did was collaborate with the Dallas Independent School District, with the Toyota Foundation, with our community partners, such as United Way and others. And when there was a high school that shut down, Pinkston in West Dallas, which is a very underserved, uh, we created a new K-8 to STEM school. And right now, it is starting with, I think, second and third graders are there right now. And next year, we're going to extend it to pre-K. So we're going to have some beautiful three- and four-year-olds uh, there as well. We've done the curriculum with the DISD. Toyota USA is so excited about it that they have said they're going to expand the work we have done across the country. So at, at SMU, what we really work to do is to collaborate uh, with these incredible partners we have in the DFW Metroplex, but um, think about everything we do from the standpoint of are we really doing our research with impact and, and um, thinking about our local community. And then when we do it in the DFW Metroplex, uh, we have now created a template, and we think about how we scale that up across the United States. And, and that's the next step that, that will be happening. Thank you. So I appreciate our panelists sharing specific examples of what they're doing to, to reach out to a broader community. Now, if you're already experiencing pain points around workforce, isn't it true that it's actually going to get worse? I mean, what first looked like a pandemic blip has turned into a higher education enrollment crisis. Nationwide, according to the data from the National Stu Student Clearinghouse, undergraduate college enrollment dropped 8% from pre-pandemic levels to now. Some of the community colleges here in California have had enrollment declines as severe as 18 to 20%. That is dramatic. And it's not uh, returning, uh, the enrollment is not returning back to what it was, even when in-person cl in classes resume. So what do you think are the implications of these trends on national, regional, even place-based innovation ecosystems? Uh, uh, oh, I think it was starting with, with Robert. We'll just cycle a little. Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Sure. Um, I think I think it... Um, First of all, some of the conversation we had earlier about um, uh, the so socioeconomics of, of this country, what Ed was just talking about a few minutes ago, I think uh, poor and students of poor families and students of color 
are disproportionately represented in these numbers. So I think that what we have to do is that we have to figure out a way to provide access and opportunity for students on all levels. And we have to start thinking about a K through 20 system. Yes, there's a demographic cliff, as people are calling it, but guess what? We knew that 10 years ago. So for colleges and universities that didn't start preparing 10 years ago, the cliff is here and is, 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 is not something new. It's something that we have to prepare for on an ongoing basis. I think that we have to look at policy, public policy like Pell Grant, and we have to figure out ways. I think it should be doubled. I think it should be indexed to inflation uh, so that uh, students who come from poor backgrounds, poor families, have the opportunity to go to college. It ought to be portable to go wherever they want to go. I think community colleges specifically um, have to um, go back to the future. That is focus. Focus on the things that they do best. Stop trying to be technical, comprehensive, associate degrees. There should be some technical schools. There should be some two-year degree schools. There should be some skill-specific schools and go from there. I think our HBCUs play a very critical role in this DEI uh, uh, pursuit in terms of building our workforce, being a graduate of one. Uh, I think there, there, there's a plethora of, of opportunity for uh, our workforce if we figure out a way to uplift those uh, uh, institutions of higher learning. And then lastly, when I think about both the public land-grant institutions and small private institutions like like mine, we have to be purposeful to make sure we're not just getting students to come to our institution, but also making sure that they graduate. You know, you know most institutions are losing, you know, 40 plus percent of their student body uh, that never graduate from college. Well, if we could just solve that issue, then guess what? You would have way more people ready for your workforce. A big part of that is preparation coming out of high school. So we gotta look at our K through 12 system. And the second piece of it is economic affordability. So I want to uh, first reiterate what Robert shared in the context of, of how we really think about the full pipeline. Um, Personally, from you know my own anecdote uh, and some of the conversations that have occurred earlier, I, I was in a junior college, pretty rural, sort of waitressing and my secretary my way up and had, because of the UC system, uh, an automatic admission into UC Davis 30 years ago. It's crazy. Um, but I never would have thought I would have been an engineer, never thought that that's what I was going to do. Um, but there was a pathway shown to me because these processes made it easy and streamlined. And there was great ways of, of getting uh, financial aid in order to push through. So we not only need to, I'd say, I agree from the standpoint of Pell Grants and the like, but what can we as, as institutions uh, do from much more robust strategic enrollment management and elasticity models? So we, we launched it. SMU last year, what we called Access SMU. So any student in Texas that was high enough GPA, we were test optional, that we were, and Pell, Pell eligible, so you're coming for free. And we, the only way we could do that, being a private, we get no state dollars. Um, the only way we could do that was to do some very robust modeling of, of how we could still meet, meet revenue. Uh, talk to donors, get people very excited and engaged about these types of initiatives of how are we really going to grow the country's um, or keep our country's state of, of innovation and strength in the tech space and in all spaces. Um, to the point about pandemic, uh, the demographic cliff, is, as we've all read about in a lot of Nathan Graw's work, actually, prior to the pandemic, was showing not to be as bad as had been predicted. In particular, the Hispanic populations had really grown, and that high school population was much higher than expected. What I think all our homework do is, to do as higher ed leaders is we now need to go out, and we're doing this at SMU, to every single person who we lost during that pandemic. We've gone all the way back to our 2014 cohort who came in 
And if they didn't graduate by 2020, we're finding every individual and saying, what can we do to get you back and help you graduate? Uh, so how do we do those in, it, do these things in ways to make sure that those who really stepped out, in particular those from uh, usually socioeconomic, they need to help their families and, and, uh, or might have lost loved ones, how do we make it easier for them to come back and complete? So um, um, I'm, I'm cons I have kind of t two ways of looking at this, two, two strains. First strain is that uh, the pandemic, like economic issues, uh, people of color are the canary in the coal mine on, on tragedies in the country. Uh, it impacts us first, it impacts us more deeply. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the pandemic itself, you think uh, who is it more likely uh, to have a problem with child support? It would be a single parent, being a multi-generational family. Uh, who is more likely to have a job that cannot be done remotely? Uh, and so um, if you were at the end of this to say, what would be one great thing, uh, Chad, nice to meet you, uh, that, that the Council of Competence could look at, um, uh, it would be something around the idea of, and again, this was a farming economy a long time ago. When I was a child, it was a manufacturing economy. It's a service economy. We haven't rethought uh, what work requ is required to actually be done at work versus what is to be done at home, right? And so some really smart thinking around that question is that what is it you really need to be in the office to do? Uh, and that should be um, softened with the idea of uh, if you're not in the office, then how do you get enculturated? Uh, how do you know the tricks of the trade? How do you know, uh, you know, I got enculturated by a little thing called basic training, eight weeks of being yelled at. Uh, and then I did it again as an officer because I didn't learn it right the first time. Uh, and so, and if you look at this newest generation coming in, these people that had maybe a senior year of high school and a first year of college in which they didn't interact, and you see how behind they are. And so who, who has done the smart thinking on what this all means, right? And how do you, how do you divide that? And how do you make some good decisions going forward? Uh, that that would, be my, uh, would be my thinking on, on the issue. Mm, all great publications, thank you. Um, so my, my third question, you know, I was really struck by the comments of the president of the Colby College. Um, you know, the vast footprint of America is served by smaller institutions and local uh, community colleges that have limited resources to tap into these new innovations. So how do we connect those communities to the exciting work house that the, you know, the big employers in the room or the national labs or the, you know, the, um, the uh, major research institutions here? So uh, when it comes to the latest and greatest, such as the breakthroughs and technologies that are going to come out of the CHIPS Act, how can the audience in this room be of help to that cause of connecting um, smaller community, diverse community, rural communities to these innovations? Um, your turn, Elizabeth. Thank you. So I tend to think of this uh, a little bit as a, as say, a wheel of innovation and and technological advancement. Um, for every major challenge, maybe if we think about uh, the grand challenges in, in the National Academy of Engineering or something that, that, we're that we are facing, not just as a national society, but as a globe, um, you have maybe a hub, right? That here's a hub institution uh, that has maybe some primary expertise in a certain area. But we all should be thinking about how are we solving critical challenges uh, facing society? What are we doing for the social good? And then out of that hub to the wheel are all these spokes. And each of those spokes can go to a multitude of, of other institutions. They should also go to companies. They can go to local governments. And, and we need to be thinking about part of the problem we're solving in, in, in our institution, we think a lot on earth hazards and national security and technology enhanced immersive learning, how to come back from the pandemic. But we should also be thinking about the workforce development and how are we ensuring that we keep our country at the forefront of technological strength as well. So in this hub, uh, it might be one institution leading at one time, uh, depending on what their strengths are and, and those spokes can be going to a uh, multitude, again, of different uh, institutions or companies. But we need to be thinking, you know, I would say in the context, um, I, I looked at the 
the front thing here, it's, I think it said competition, right, or competitiveness or something. I think it's more cooperation. <laughs> you know, how do we cooperate and have partnerships together to really not just solve global challenges, but make sure that we, we bring in these missing millions and, uh, and we are moving forward in workforce development. And um, so that, that's how I think about it. Thank you. You know, I had a, a conversation with Dr. Tom Mitchell of Carnegie Mellon, and he built the first machine learning academic program in the country. He said, you know, and he's writing this report to Congress on AI and, and the workforce. Um, I said, what would be, have been so helpful, or it could be helpful, is if Carnegie Mellon, because you are the leading institution in this, could invite 50 community colleges or rural college or uh, HCBUs, have the faculty come to your campus and learn the fundamentals, and then they will bring back the, that knowledge or a certificate back to their institutions and begin seeding that knowledge in the, the local institution. Again, you know, do you want to be uh, all of us that are observers of the winners over there, or do we want all, you know, all of us to be able to participate in this economy? So let me turn over to you, Ed. What do you think about this issue of, of how, do, how, how can the audience here help so uh, one of the things that we have found that's actually worked, uh, be, being an employer, uh, we saw a, a very good briefing we were at Howard last summer from the chair of the Aerospace, uh, the, uh, Aerospace Department Chair Association that says uh, the biggest building block, the biggest difference maker, particularly in people of color when it comes to being successful in school and successful in that first job is internship. Like, who knew that? Who knew that? Uh, and it compounds second, third in internships. They have, they have colleges that have programs where you start an internship as a freshman at a company, and then you can build and build and build on that, right? Uh, if you're an intern, you have a summer long, multiple year opportunity to sell yourself, right? And so it's interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth talked about uh, being a junior college student. I was a junior college student. It took me to go to junior college, Tacoma Community College, to get over the hump to qualify for the electrical engineering uh, fellowship uh, scholarship that, that, that put me on this path. And so I'd say internships, and then also uh, I think something in, uh, has been lost in the past few years. Uh, there's this fantasy that to be successful, you're gonna graduate at 17 and a half or 18 uh, out of high school and do four years and then have to live after. Some people have a more interesting story uh, um, some of, right, and some some of us, some of us, uh, you were waitress. Some of us were enlisted, uh, and and I think that particularly when you went look at people of color, uh, particularly Hispanics actually, uh, and women, stepping your way up through, right, and seeing these near term opportunities as the as steps on a path to put you in this audience, is bringing that idea back. There was a saying when I was growing up, oh, pulled herself up by her bootstraps. Who hears that anymore? And so now people's parents are pulling out their applications to Harvard when they're in kindergarten. Okay, great, great. But other people need to make it too if this country is going to continue to be number one, right? Other, pe other people have to make it, right? And so often, if you're a woman, a person of, woman of color particularly, a person of color or a woman, uh, you're the first person in the family to go to college. You talk about generational wealth, you're helping your family be successful. And so you have to have a broader spectrum of people in this great country see a path to success. And I believe we've lost that. I believe we've lost, we, we have lost some emphasis on, on that. Uh, I have a lot to say about that topic, but I'll close for now. All right, so now I'm gonna ask my closing question and that we'll, we'll start from Elizabeth and, and, and go go down the row here. Um, all of us in this room, I would, um, I'd guess that the average number of degrees we all have is at least two to five is my guess, right? Um, so we all believe in higher education and the value of higher education. But the truth nowadays is that there's been diminished trust and faith in higher education um, as that pathway into uh, economic mobility. And so to to make sure that our institutions remain available, affordable, relevant to the missing millions, what is your uh, advice, final advice to the audience? So, Elizabeth? Um, well, I, you know, I think that's a two part sort of component to that, because there's one thing about the distrust um, and 
it's it's across the political spectrum. It used to be, you know, far right hated us for whatever reasons. Now far left hates us for whatever reasons, and it's just uh, and now, you know, frankly, there's just a distrust in higher ed at a level that um, I haven't seen, and um, and so I think part of what's inherent on us is uh, we need to communicate better what we do, and we need to. Uh, think about what are the accountability or the metrics or what can we do ourselves personally at our own institutions uh, to to uh, to push back that distrust. I think one is just a lot of communication. I don't think people fully understand or who, who wherever this is coming from, there's a lot of lack of understanding, a lot of anecdotes around, oh, someone's had these, look at these crazy loans these people are taking in, in private institutions. You can't afford to go there. Our students graduate with an average of $18,000 of debt, you know, at, at a elite private university. So we've got to communicate those better. Um, but I also, what we talk a lot about with my leadership team is how do we really look at student success much more broadly. Uh, student success for us is not, did they graduate? That obviously is critical. We do look at that. And, you know, we want everybody to graduate. Um, but it goes beyond. Are we helping them in the next steps? Do they feel like... Uh, they are lifelong members of our community. Can they? Can we help them um, think about their jobs, their roles? Um, are we giving back and doing good for the community? Are we focusing on areas that really do matter? So, from the standpoint of what we think about at the institutional level, uh, that plays a lot into it. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, the more, like I said, that that we can break down the walls uh, across institutions and um, and whether the and governments, whether they're local, regional, state, and uh, and work together, the more we'll we'll come over and uh, jump that hurdle. Thanks. It's all about the data. It's all about the data, and it's all about the data. The research is is still very very clear. There is a direct correlation with education and lifelong earnings. And it's true now, it has been true, and I think it will be true for years to come. But I do think we have to look at a K through 20 system. Everyone's not meant to go to college. Uh, and by the way, the Harvards and Yales of the world, they only enroll about 5% of all college going students. It's the other 95% of us uh, at institutions of higher learning who have to look at student success, look at the outcomes, look at uh, jobs, you know, is one thing for your students to come to our institutions, but are they able to get jobs? You know, what are, what's the job placement rate? So how do we create this ecosystem, this ecosystem? One of the things that each and every one of you can do uh, in industry is partner with your local colleges and universities and, and, and be part of that ecosystem. She, she called it a will. Elizabeth called it a will. Um, and give a thousand dollar scholarship to students coming uh, into the institution saying you know what if you major in x y or z you're going to have a co-op or internship and we build our own we grow our own guess what that's not only going to help you with your labor force it's also going to help with graduation and retention rates because they now have the co-op opportunities and dei we cannot let that go uh, the K through 12 system is already a majority minority student body. Demography is destiny. And we have to look at all of our organizations and hold ourselves accountable, uh, not just with recruiting students, but making sure our faculty and staff look like and reflect uh, the communities that we will be serving. Uh, thank you for that, that last question. That's a great question. So uh, uh, October of 1957, uh, the Russians became the first space power. Uh, the next president, a few years later, said the goal was to send Americans to the moon and return them spacely, safely to Earth within the next decade. And that inspiration uh, created the space uh, power that this country became and didn't in a decade it happened. And so I would circle back to the inspirational aspect of college. Uh, tying it to your personal success. And, uh, you know, the White House has one called ins uh, Inspire, Prepare, and Employ. Uh, and so our goal within Space Workforce uh, 2030 is to reach 5 million K-12 through students a year with inspirational space-related activities, whether it be Girl Scouts, Badge in a Day, 
uh, whether it be Space Camp, uh, and then do up to 3,000, uh, that's Inspire part, right? And then do up to, and, it, and it's really, you can go on, uh, everyone knows that it's somewhere between third grade and, and, and sixth grade, you lose girls, right, uh, from, from math, and, and like why, there's no bio biology that explains that. So you wanna get them inspired, and then through these internships provide opportunity, right? Prepare, and then get them jobs, right? Um, you know, why space? Because it's cool, right? <laughs> no, space, the space industry has grown uh, by 20% over the last four years. Uh, average jobs, $151,000 a year. Uh, that might even be okay even in San Francisco, right? <laughs> right? And it's an opportunity, right? Only 9% only nine percent of the executives uh, in this industry are women, so that's a great opportunity for growth. Uh, um, only, oh, excuse me, 25 percent, and only nine percent are blacks and Hispanic. Total. So great opportunity for growth. Very inspirational. But again, back to what uh, my colleague said: uh, help people better understand the correlation between school and their own personal success. All right. Thank you for listening. Well, wonderful advice from our panel. I, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I appreciate them letting me ask the hard questions, and I want to give you a round of applause for being such a great 240 audience. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'm not going to make anyone do calisthenics. I thought that's what Vaughn was going to do. Yeah. But um, thanks to the great panel, and thanks everyone for sticking with us for the day. Um, this was the last plenary session. We have a little break now, about 20 minutes. We're going to transition to a one-hour working group conversation. I want to talk a little bit about that before we head off for some coffee and a little snacks, and ask you to give you give ask you to give us one more hour of your time and energy. The, one of the reasons we came to UC Davis, for the many reasons was, again, to launch the second phase of work in our National Commission. We had a very successful report in 2020 with competing in the next economy, but we have an opportunity between now and December to develop the next major report from the Council on Competitiveness. We do that with the community. That doesn't just happen in our office in Washington, D.C. So I want to thank you in advance for spending an hour of, of your afternoon with us in breakout sessions, two hours tomorrow, that will be the beginning of some conversations to help us elicit new ideas uh, for policy recommendations. The purposes of the plenary panels up to now were to perhaps inspire some thinking. Um, so well, how do you get to your working group? It's easy. On the back of your name tag is a QR code. You should be able to scan it now, and there should be an active link listing the sessions. There are four breakout sessions. So you should be able to find your name, with a working group assignment and a room number. If the rooms are all just next door, so there's no, you don't have to walk anywhere else or change buildings. But if you have any questions, there's a team at the registration desk who can also help you identify where your room is. So a little break. Show up at your rooms at 3.50. So you've got about 20, 25 minutes here to grab a cup of coffee, catch up with your colleagues, check some emails. We'll come back here at 5 o'clock or so for some final remarks from Deborah and our chancellor, and we'll transition to our evening program, a reception, a fireside chat with the chancellor, and of course, our dinner. So thanks, and we'll see you back here at five.